Hi, everybody, and welcome to Flock Talk. I'm Robin Sullivan from the Leather Elves, and I'm here with Jack Pine from High Redbird. Hey, Jack, how's it going? Doing pretty good here, Robin. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I put all my winter clothes away because um, it was springtime. I've got my flowers here, um, and it snowed today. <laughs> Look, there's oh, butterflies. <laughs> that makes me feel so much better. Uh, so is it is it warm and springy in Texas? It is overcast and drizzly and slightly miserable. So don't feel too bad. Uh, I was going to say, l let me try to look sad just for a moment. Um, <laughs> oh, so anyway, no, life is pretty good. Um, and with the spring coming, we've been Jack and I have been talking a lot about uh, those windows being open, the doors being open, spring break, and the kids coming and going. And with that also comes the fly off. So we we wanted to talk about that, but do we have any um, announcements tonight, Jack, or things to remind people about? Well, we we have a few announcements that we like to make. So first of all. If you guys have not already done so, you want to make sure that you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook. Uh, we do these live streams from the Leather Elves page. If you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook, you will get notifications whenever we do a live stream, so you'll make sure that you don't miss out. Now, in the event that something happens, uh, you're not able to be with us for the live portion, which, of course, we always want. Our feelings will be lightly hurt if you're not here for the live portion, but you know, we'll, we'll carry on. We'll find the strength somehow. Um, if you want to make sure that you don't miss out on any of the information, the things we talk about, uh, you can go ahead and subscribe to the High Red Bird YouTube channel. Uh, that is going to give you the opportunity to see all of the discussions that Robin and I have had and posted. Uh, they're actually all together as part of a playlist. So you could watch all of them start to finish. Uh, at this point, I think we are at... Uh, over 20 hours worth of discussion. Um, so if you guys are going on a road trip, um, if you're planning anything like that, um, it would be an excellent thing to do. Now we do have an event coming up and you don't have to road trip for it. Um, you, I mean, you can if you want to, but there's not going to be anywhere you can go for the Place Your Bets conference because that's going to be a virtual conference. Uh, Robin and I are actually putting this together. It'll be happening mid-June, um, so you can go ahead and visit theleatherelves.net to find more information on that. You can scan the QR code that is on your screen right now. Um, we have Nick behind the curtain, as always, and he does an absolutely phenomenal job of making that information so accessible for you guys. We have a variety of speakers from all around the world. We have multiple hands-on workshops that you guys will be able to participate in. We have a virtual happy hour. So you get the camaraderie of being with other parrot people without having to drive anywhere, um, without having to make hotel accommodations, airfare accommodations. So it should be a lot of fun. And again, that's going to be coming up mid-June. Are you excited about it, Robin? I am very excited about it. I'm even more excited that people can binge watch us if they want. <laughs> I, I, I think that's super exciting. And I, I just, it, it really makes me happy that, that that's the case. Cause as a binge watcher myself, uh, I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling good about that. So it's been a lot of work to get to this point. It has. And we, I mean, if you want to binge watch us, binge watch previous episodes, you can certainly do that. But we do always encourage people to log on for the live stream, be a part of the conversation, because there's always more interaction that goes on in the comment section. Plus, we give stuff away, and that's a lot of fun. Um, we always do some kind of trivia at the end of every session, so you want to make sure you stick around for the session. We will tell you um, what the answers are to whatever the trivia questions we're going to bring up in the session. So even if you're worried that you're not good at trivia, um, it, it's going to be included in the session. So you'll know the answer to win a fabulous prize. Uh, but we are also, we have a giveaway. We, if we can hit 50 viewers at any one 
time. Uh, we come close, but we haven't quite hit it yet. If we hit 50 viewers at any one time, we will be giving away a prize. Uh, we're going to be giving away one of the high Redbird shirts. Um, so we have a variety of different shirts there. Um, so whoever wins that would be able to pick out which shirt they want. Um, they're all fun. They're bird themed. If you don't want to play the waiting game with that, if you don't want to run the risk of seeing if you might maybe answer the trivia question right or wrong, um, you can, of course, just visit the High Red Bird Threadless store, that QR code's on your screen. Get your shirts now, um, and then you don't even have to worry about that, but we will be giving one of those away if we can hit fewer 50 viewers at any one time. We can do that. I, I, I know we're going to give those away. I'm sorry, Jack, but we are. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot going on and it's kind of exciting. Um, but we really, I want to get to what we're, we're talking about tonight. And that's the reality of possibly having an escaped parrot. And, you know, there are some things that, so I hear phrases all the time like, oh, no, he loves me. He would always come back. Or, um, no, he's clipped, so that won't happen. And I think, you know, you really need to think about those kind of issues. So, big statement for the night, even clipped birds can fly. Write that down somewhere. Be, and Or <laughs> get a tattoo that says it. Because... You know, it's it's so true. Jack, you I know I've experienced clip birds that can fly. Yeah, I, I think the important thing for people to remember is that birds do not weigh that much. So even if you clip their wings, they can still generate enough force. They can get some lift. Maybe they can't fly 30, 60 miles in one stretch, uh, but they can definitely still fly enough to get out of the house, to get up into a tree, um, to then fly from one tree to the next tree. And no matter how your birds are trimmed, because there are multiple ways to trim wings for, you know, different uh, goals. If you want just to sort of slow them down, especially with babies, that's going to be a pretty common thing because um, obviously you don't want them building up too much momentum to crash into something. Um, so even if the wing tips are just rounded, they can still fly away. Um, if you have birds where you've, you know, done a trim that is, uh, you know, only on one side, which ideally would throw them off a little bit so they can't fly as well, they can still fly. Um, mm -hmm. Birds are kind of incredible in that aspect. And I will say, um, when I worked at the bird department at the Houston Zoo, there were times where we would get in a bird that uh, had. Uh, we, we got in a wood stork that had a broken wing that we were told that bird is non-releasable. It will never fly. So it was kept in an enclosure that with an open top and we went to go get it out of quarantine. Uh, and every bird keeper in the department just had to do a, Oh wow. As the bird flew over you. And we couldn't even do anything for a second because it was beautiful to watch. It's like, Oh look, she, she can fly. Oh, that's not good. So Let's go catch her now. Um, so birds are awesome. They can fly. That's kind of, you know, thing. lift happens too. I mean, maybe that's another tattoo. Lift happens because if you've ever seen vultures ridge soaring, they'll go to a, a cliff or a ridge, a ridge line, and then they catch the updraft. They kept catch the thermals and they get this kind of free ride up higher. And for a bird that is not an experienced flyer, a bird that you are assuming cannot fly, if they catch a thermal, they're going to get higher than they know what to do with. And there's a chance they're going to get further than they know how to get back from. And it may go, you know, they may go quite a distance and then not be able to physically get back just because they don't have those muscles. They haven't built up those muscles um, that a flyer would have. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into the reality of it, but, you know, Jack, what's your best uh, suggestion for how to not have this happen? So I am often called captain of the no fun police because <laughs> I play the game of assessing what is the worst 
possible scenario. What could possibly go wrong with everything? Um, and then I try to build plans around that. So if you have a bird in your house and you know there's going to be other people coming into your house, if it's spring break, if people are on vacation, make sure that they know what the rules are with that bird. Make sure things like windows and doors, that you're checking them to make sure that they are secure. Make sure that the cage doors, the food bowls, uh, I know a lot of people have talked to us about this. A lot of my birds, when they get bored, they have the ability to open up their food doors and just walk right out of the cage. Uh, mm -hmm. Cockatoos especially are notorious for that. Um, so being aware of things like that, do you need to add any sort of secondary things to help keep that from happening? Basically, this is one of those situations that... An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The best thing you can do in this situation is try to develop a plan so that it's not going to happen to you. Um, and right. that is going to be coming from people who have dealt with this. We still, I, I still make plans for everything. Um, and, you know, accidents still happen. Um, birds are very fast. Um, and as I get older, I don't want to believe that I'm getting slower. Um, so I think birds are getting faster as I get older. Um, but there, there's definitely things that can happen. It's true. No, it's absolutely true. I'm just giving you a hard time. But I think too, you know, even in the situation where you've got secondary containment, you've got a door with a space with another door into an aviary or out to your, you know, to your backyard it's still possible for this to happen. You know, the wind takes one door, opens it, the second door gets opened by someone and bang, the bird is gone. So it's really about being diligent. And, you know, despite all that diligence, it's still going to happen. So being prepared, you know, how do we, how do we make sure that we're ready for this? Well, I think one of the things that I would suggest is to put together a fly-off kit for lack of a better term. Um, and in that, these are the things that I think you should have on hand, a crate or a cage if possible, you know, and it would be really great if it was the crate or cage that that particular bird was used to. Um, so it's not something brand new because we all know that um, a lot of our birds are a bit skittish around new things. So um, a crate or a cage, if you've got a big sliding door and you can wheel the cage right outside, by all means, that's the way to go. Um, a towel, because you may need to use your toweling experience. And again, if the bird is, is, has been desensitized or has done some training around a towel, then that will you know, make life easier. Water, food and treats. Know your bird's favorite treat. I mean, don't you think, you know, bribery is important? Yeah, I, I think it's one of those things where, you know, a lot of times as trainers, we, we look at the approaches to things and think, oh, well, I don't want to use bribery or coercion to get my bird into a crate because, you know, those have a negative connotation. I'm going to tell you right now that if your bird is outside and I have to bribe it with uh, you know a handful of treats to make sure that it is secured somewhere to get it into a travel carrier, that's what I'm gonna do. Because in that instance, me having that bird secured, ensuring that bird is safe is the top priority. So when you're in a situation like that, just make sure you prioritize <laughs> what your goals are. Um, but yeah, bribery, especially in this instance, I would say can definitely be your friend. I agree. And, you know, binoculars, because I don't know about you. See, well, as Jack gets older, the birds get faster. As um, I get older, the birds get smaller. I think that's how it works. I can't see them as well if they're far away. So you might want to get, you know, some binoculars, have that on hand. A first aid kit, because unfortunately, sometimes these situations, they'll be, you know, a broken feather or, um, you know, some cuts and scrapes or, you know, you name it, it's a possibility. So you want to have that first aid kit on hand to just grab and take with you. Audio files. So back in the day, I used to say, you know, um, make a recording and 
you don't need to do that anymore. It's all, it can all be on your phone. Um, and those audio files of either flock mates, you know, if you've got other birds in the house, the sounds, sometimes that'll work. You can even bring a flock mate outside if that's, if you've got a safe way to do that. Um, and same species calls just so that, you know, maybe it's like, oh, wait, there's another similar bird and they'll come back. Um, can you think of anything else, Jack, that we should have in for this? Um, I, I think that list sounds absolutely great. Um, and a couple of things just to point out to people. I mean, some of these, you know, just should be common sense too, but um, you know, so things like your water, um, your food and your treats, if you are going to have this prepackaged ready to go, um, you want to make sure that like you have a sealed bottle of water. You want to make sure that you have, uh, either dehydrated or dry treats, things that are going to have staying power. Cause you don't want to say, oh, Hey, I put away my bird's favorite things. And they're in that tote that we're going to use if the bird ever flies off six months later, the bird flies off. You grab the tote, open it up, and see that it's it's moldy food or anything like that. So just make sure you're paying attention um, to things like that. Um, but yeah, most of these items you could easily put just in a tote. Just have it ready um, to go. Um, and I am I am annoying about things like this, um, but I like to get the size tote that if I have a travel carrier. Um, a tote that'll fit like directly on top of it so that I know it'll be really easy for me to move around with things. Um, and like that sort of planning, if you make it easy on yourself before you need it, um, you're going to thank yourself if you ever do need it. And again, hopefully you won't, but if you are prepared, at least you're ready to go if it does happen. Definitely. And I think, you know, the other thing you should be doing is creating kind of a photo record of your bird um, so that because Jack and I, when we were discussing this topic, one of the things we came up with was your bird doesn't always look the same. You know, it may be during a molt. It may be, you know, hopefully not, but a new feather plucked spot. It may, you know, it, there are so many factors that can go into how your bird looks. And so if you document, if you do a regular, um, you know, Jack, Jack mentioned there's a group someone recommended doing, if you're doing weights, when you do your weekly weight, do a picture at the same time. I don't remember which group that was, Jack. Um, but yeah, if you've got a photo record and then create a template now, like tonight, this weekend, I don't care when, but create a lost bird flyer. Because I can tell you the flyers are so very important. And if you've got all that information just set up on your computer, saved in a file, when, you know, unfortunately, when this happens, you're going to need those. So you take the most current photo, you drop it in that flyer, and you print them off. Um, anything, any other suggestions about that, Jack? Um. Again, the photos are going to be incredibly important because... Most people who might see your bird, they're probably not going to be bird people. So they may not understand exactly what they are seeing. I've gotten calls that people have reached out to me for, oh, hey, I think there's a, I think it's a macaw in my backyard. Can you come help it? And I get there and it's a Quaker parrot. Um, so something like a photo, um, especially, again, if you're doing weights, if you have anything that has a sense of scale because a lot of people aren't necessarily going to be the best with how big is that bird. Um, those are going to be very, very helpful. Um, you also want to make sure that you have information about your bird ready. So if your bird has a band, um, you want to make sure that you have that band number um, so that you know it. If your bird has a microchip, um, all of this is going to help you just be able to identify your bird. Absolutely. And, you know, <clears throat> the other thing you want to have is um, a list of phone numbers. You know, you've got your resource list that if this happens, this is who you're going to call. And on that list, you want to include things like local uh, pet stores, local, you know, bird specialty shops, vets, uh, the shelter. Um, you want to put uh, parrot groups and then you can use those. You can call, you can, you know, whatever needs to happen, 
but to let people know that your bird is out there. You know, the more people that know, the better off uh, you're going to be. So you want to have that. And the other, another thing to do to prepare is really work on training those behaviors that might come in handy. Um, you know, things like, we, you know, we're going to talk about recall training. Um, Joel, that's a great recommendation. An app like Nextdoor. I don't. I mean, we we use that all the time um, up here in New Hampshire, and I think it's you know, if there's a local page that that uh, you've got, you know, your neighborhood has a page or your town has a page. Those are great um, things to to get that word out there because the more eyes you've got looking, the better off you're going to be. Um, what other kind of behaviors would you suggest, Jack? I think we're going to talk about recall training, um, crate training. What else? Yeah. So first of all, I'm just going to say any training that you do with your bird, any amount that your bird is socialized, is interacting with you, that is all going to play into your favor because you are going to need that bit of a relationship if your bird is out of its enclosure, out of the house, if it's scared, if it's stressed. Um, it It's a whole different world out there. So mm -hmm. first of all, any training that you're doing, I would say is useful. Um, I would say work on step up training. And especially if you have a uh, a stick or a perch, even if your bird doesn't need that, if your bird doesn't do it for you, um, you know, or it's not an issue for you. Um, if your bird steps up on your hand every time, that's great. But if there's somebody who finds your bird and you can tell them here, get them to step up on uh, like a a handle to something that that can be incredibly helpful, especially if it's people who are afraid of birds. Um, plus, it also gets your bird used to new different things, desensitized to things. Um, that regular crate training that we talked about um, and things like towel training. Again, all of this desensitizes your bird to any of the, you know, stressful, scary things that may happen as you're trying to get them back into some kind of containment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, another good suggestion, Adrian, feed and supply stores in some more rural areas, definitely. Um, you know, I think there, so there are a lot of different behaviors you can, can work on. And, you know, again, it just goes right along with that whole keeping up on training, keeping, th you know, things like that uh, current with your bird is really important. Um, so some of the things that the tips for when you're going out to recover your bird. The most important thing, here's, I, I'm going to just be covered with tattoos because here's another um, tattoo. So, and I, actually I could use it for other things too, but the most important tip I can give you um, is to remain calm. Would I mean, don't you agree, Jack? Yeah, I, I have been there and I can tell you that the feeling of just helplessness and then also frustration because what did I do? Did I not secure something? I let the bird out or somebody else let the bird out and now I'm mad at them. Like all of these things are going to be going on. None of those are going to be helpful to you. Um, it is important to remember if you stay calm, you are going to be able to formulate a better plan you are going to have the best chance of getting your bird back. So staying calm is the important first step. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so, so once you kind of let that, cause there's going to be a, a flood of emotions and adrenaline. And once you kind of get, you've got to get that under control and you've got to do it pretty quickly. So once you've got that done, um, you need to do your best to maintain visual contact. Because once that bird gets out of eye shot, now you need to do, you need to go that step further. So, um, you know, pull those binoculars out if you have to, but keep your eye on the bird. If delegate. So if you've got visual contact and you need someone to start calling and you need to start calling your, your posse and your, your group that's going to help you with this, then you need to kind of stay on, you know, stay on the visual and have somebody else call, you know, just have it, have it be a, um, okay, you know, so-and-so you're delegated. You're the one that's going to make the phone calls. So 
visual contact. You agree, Jack, that would be the first, um, your first kind of go-to? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would say it is very easy to loot. So one of the things you'll learn about birds um, when they get out, a tremendous number of parrots are primarily green. Um, so when they fly off into a tree, it is very easy to lose sight of them. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's not just because I'm getting old. It's true. Um, so you, you've got that visual. Then you're going to call get someone to call friends or you're going to call friends. Um, and at this point in time, unless there's some other emergency going on, something you cannot leave, that bird is your priority. That bird is what, you know, you need to be focused on to, to, uh, to make sure that you don't lose sight of it. So if you've got a visual at that point, you want to maybe try a recall. And if that doesn't work, you still need to stay right there. Um, you know, it's a matter of, all right, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to just kind of watch what's going on. Try that recall. Okay, maybe we're not ready. Maybe the bird's not ready to come down at that point. This is a grand adventure for some of our birds. It's terrifying, perhaps. It's a grand adventure. I mean, we have no idea what's going on in this bird's head um, while they're out. So you want to you want to stay there and make sure that your bird can see you. Um, any suggestions around that, Jack? So again, just building your relationship with your bird is going to help because then you become the safe space for your bird. So if they are out in the world, whether they are terrified, if it was a horrible mistake and they don't know how they got there, because I've seen birds that are in that situation, or this is the best thing ever, I'm going to go out and have fun. Um, you can still be that point of, okay, that that's my safe space over there. So your bird will probably do its best if it can see you to keep visual contact with you as well. That just gets a little bit harder because the bird is smaller. It blends in with the trees uh, and they have much better vision than us. So they mm -hmm. can get a little bit further away and still see us. Um, so yes, I would say keeping yourself visible for your bird um, can be one of those things as well. And I think too, along with that goes... Um, that there should be a point person and it's probably going to be you as the owner um, because what happens is our friends get super excited. You know, they want to help. They want to, I can help. I'll be there. I can. And then you've got 15 people yelling at the bird and the bird is just like, wait, what? You know, Debbie mentioned that it could be potentially vastly enriching for your bird. So now your bird's out there having, you know, this great adventure. Look at all this cool stuff. The trees are moving. I'm experiencing things. I'm gauging what's going on around me. And now you've got all your friends are yelling, you know, come back, Flippy, or, you know, whatever. I don't know where that came from. Um, but <laughs> I could not think of a bird's name to save my life. But um, so, yeah, all these people are calling and the bird now is like, I, I don't know where I'm supposed to go. There were butterflies. There was something going on. I don't know. It might be rocket surgery. I, I'm not sure. Am I trying to find a bird name? I don't know. But anyway, so along with keeping visual on your bird and having your bird being able to keep visual on you is that you want to stay far enough away from the tree or whatever the structure is that they're on so that the bird can come down. So if you've got a bird that is skilled, a skilled flyer, maybe they know how to come down. If you've got a bird that this is the fur, you know, this is Ferris Bueller's day off, then you're, they're out there and they're like, Okay, I'm in the tree. I don't know how to come down, right, Adrian? Birds have never, some birds have never learned to fly down and they won't recognize home from up in a tree. So you've got to stand far enough away that there's a glide path for them to come down. And I think we make this, this mistake. I, I've seen it done a, probably 50 times, 100 times, where people put the cage or the crate, whatever that focal point is, they put it right at the base of the tree. So now the bird's doing one of these 
It's like, um, yeah, that's, that's great, but I have no idea how to get there. And they might figure out that they could climb down, but yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, it's definitely going to depend on your situation because there are some times where, yeah, especially if your bird is not an accomplished flyer, but if there is a clear path for them to climb down, um, they can they can do that, but you're going to have to assess what's going on around you. Where did that bird end up? How are you going to get it down? And I mean, it's not, and, you know, we think about that, okay, it's just common sense. Well, it it is and it isn't. I mean, I've seen accomplished bird trainers, you know, work in a show. Ha- we have a fly off. It's, you know, this is, and we're not talking of small bird. We're talking, um, you know, an eagle, not a bald eagle, but an eagle and um, a fish eagle, which is a good sized bird. And this fish eagle is up in the tree and the trainer brings the crate over and puts it at the bottom. And I'm like, that's not going to work. You know, now you've got all your zoo visitors there and you've got this thing at the bottom of the tree and the fish eagle was like, yeah, no, that's not happening. In fact, I kind of like it up here. So, you know, and that's the other thing too, if you've got a bird that's not comfortable, so maybe we want to add socialization to one of the things that you're working on training, because if you've got all these people out there and you've got the, the bird up there who's not comfortable with a lot of different people and now it's all these people are trying to get it to come to them that is just not going to happen you know so you want to make sure you're giving him enough room to get down um to giving flippy enough room to get down to um the crate (laughs) so so jack what happens when the sun sets okay so um birds roost at night. That is a normal thing for them. So if the sun sets, there is a very good chance that unless disturbed by something, your bird is going to sit down in a tree or well, perch in a tree. Birds don't sit, um, but park itself in a tree and it will be there until it is light. Um, So as long as there's not a predator, as long as, you know, you guys aren't startling the bird. And that you know, that can be one of the most stressful aspects when you get people to help you that aren't bird people. They don't regularly interact with birds and they think, I'm going to help. And they terrify a bird so that it then flies away. And because it's dark, you're not now going to be able to see where that bird is. Um, you know, th- a, a good thing here that I'll point out, um, a lot of birds that live in colonies Uh, A lot of people who have birds in their house have pointed out that first thing in the morning and at the very end of the day, their birds are incredibly vocal. Um, And Mm -hmm. that is a flock aspect. Birds call out to their friends. uh, Hey, did you live through the day? Hey, did you live through the night? Um, The reason it can be annoying in our homes Um, If you recognize that they think of you as their flock mates and they want to check to make sure that you lived through the night, um, that can actually make it a little bit better for you, um, at least in terms of addressing it. But it means that it'll help you keep a really clear indicator of where that bird is. It's definitely true. And, you know, I think you've got to be prepared to. So if you're going to go home. If it gets dark and you still haven't recovered flippy, then you need to either you're either going to stay or you go home, you get some sleep, you regroup, you make some more flyers, you go out and you hang up some flyers, you know, use your time productively, but you better be ready to be out there um, at the crack of dawn, you know, because that's when they're going to, to be awake. That's, it's not, you know, they're going to wait till your household wakes up. It's okay. Wow. The sun came up and uh, and they're outside and now it's time. Um, Diane brings up a good point. And so did Kimberly that a lot of people look super high instead of looking at head level or on the ground. And, you know, our birds, it just because we expect them to be in trees is not where they necessarily are going to be. I do this when I'm driving down the highway Um, I expect that deer only come from the left to the right. Um, So I kind of keep, make sure there's no, 
yeah, that's in my head. Um, and, you know, I think we do the same thing when we think about our birds being, you know, up high all the time. And it's just about, Debbie brought up another good point back a little bit about um, being polite, which is tough sometimes. You're freaking out. Your bird is flown off. Um, but being polite with people because, yeah, try your best to be polite, but get people to help by watching for flight paths. Um, and they can do that far away. They don't have to be right on top of you to do that, you know, and get people, get a network going so that, you know, Adrian mentioned the neighborhood kids, get a network going so that people are communicating and, you know, maybe your bird's here and then 10 minutes later, he's over here. And it's really, really important that that communication happens. The other thing you want to explain to people, if you've got a group of people working with you, is to not start jumping up and down and screaming when the bird starts to fly to you. Because I've seen this go horribly wrong more than once, where the bird is like done with being up in the tree, done with being, you know, out, whatever, and wants to just come on over, get some food and chill a little bit. And the bird starts to, you can, you, you have, you can watch the bird's body language when the bird does the like crouch and that's when they're going to go. And you've got to keep your eyes open for that. And when you see that crouch, you know, they're either going to come to you or they're going to go someplace else. If they're coming to you and everybody around you starts like going, Oh, yay, here he comes. Yay. Oh, good. yeah. Chances are that bird's not going to come. So yeah, you can, you can either cause a bird not to fly to you when it was about to. Um, and the good news is because birds that are in our home tend not to fly as much, that posturing before they go to fly is even more pronounced. So you'll know it's coming. Um, so if, that, if it stops then, you're going to be frustrated. Uh, if the bird goes to fly to you and people start yelling and the bird gets startled and immediately just veers off, you're going to be frustrated. And undoubtedly, the the worst thing that you can feel is if you get a bird to fly, like it flies to your arm and you're like, okay, the carrier is right over there. I need to walk slowly eight feet with this bird on my arm and people around you yell and they're all excited and they run up to you and the bird flies away. And it's like, I, I had you, we just, we had to move very slowly and it, it didn't work. So. Um, Try to be polite with people and try to make sure that they know what that plan is before you get to that point. Absolutely. So you want to make sure you've you've contacted everyone that you need to help. Um, and it really is so important that everyone remains calm. You know, the most important thing, remain calm and try to make sure that everyone in your group remains calm as well. So there are quite a few resources online um, that you can use too. So if you go home, you know, and you take a break and you, you just can't, you got to take a break and you, or you go home after dark, some of these, you know, these are some groups you can reach out to parrotalert.com, USA 911 Parrot Lost and Found, which is on Facebook, local parrot groups, things like Flight Club and Lips. I know both of those groups do a ton of thing, you know, a ton of work when people lose their birds. You know, I want to, you know, Debbie uh, does amazing work, Debbie and her crew um, and the crew at, at uh, Kiko's Toy Chest out in Washington State. I don't know if it's the weather or your windows are just open more often out there, but um, there, there's like every couple of days I'm seeing a bird out and in Long Island, you know, you guys have, are starting to have nice weather too. And so I know, and I know that Diane works with um, with the Long Island Parrot Society, and um, she also said Connecticut Parrot Society has shared a link before as well. Um, local wildlife rehabbers, you know, rehabilitators, they may end up having your bird because people don't know where it goes. Um, local law enforcement, shelters. If you contact a shelter or you reach out to a shelter, make sure that you, they know. Um, what you're looking for. Make sure that they understand um, what you're talking about. And um, I also have produced a DVD called Get Your Bird Back. And it's available for download on the website um, for a small fee. And it's also available, you can get the hard copy. Uh, Barb Heidenreich and I put that together many years ago. And um, yeah, I look super young in that. You should get it and just 
picture me that way. Um, but yeah, see, there you go. Um, look at how young I was. But uh, so there's a lot of good information in there. There's a lost bird template. There are um, a lot of, uh, you can download calls. So, um, but if you're going to get that, get it before you need it. Um, it's It shouldn't be, you know, oh, I, my bird flew away and now I got to order this and download it and I'm going through all this. Have these resources ready, um, you know, when or before something happens. Well, and so that's part of why Robin and I have been doing our live stream sessions, because so many aspects of bird care do come down to a have this ready before you need it. Um, so yeah. things like that resource list, things like having a, a travel carrier or a crate for your bird. Um, realistically, you should have a travel carrier or a crate before you even have a bird, um, because otherwise, how are you? getting your bird. Uh, so having those things ready, um, you know, all, all of this, if you just have it ready beforehand, it's going to be a lot less stressful when you actually need it. Um, there's that list of resources for, you know, all, all the different organizations that Robin listed. Um, but then of course we were also earlier talking about resources that are going to be important for you locally as well. So make sure that you have just a list of names and numbers of veterinarian offices, of pet stores, feed stores, all of these places can help you get your bird back. Um, but the exact list that you are going to need to put together is going to be highly variable depending on where you live and what is around you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so the flip side of all of this is if you find a bird, so I know it's a dream come true to just have a macaw fly into your life. Um, but sometimes, you know, a bird will will end up in your backyard. And as someone who knows something about birds, you know how to, you know, ask it to step up or, you know, you know how to get it to come to some food. And so the the question is, what do you do when you find that bird? What would you suggest to people, Jack? So. A couple of things to remember, because one, I know a lot of people are going to think, oh, well, this bird just it flew into my house. It's it's my bird now. Um, one, you know, if you have this beautiful bird that flies into your house, um, they didn't get that way by accident. Somebody cares about that bird. Someone is most likely looking for that bird. If the bird is, you know, bedraggled and rough looking. It's a pet bird that got outside and has been surviving in the wild. Um, so remember, that is not an indication of that bird's home. Like there is somebody that had that bird. Um, there is somebody that cares about that bird. Just try to think about what would happen to you if you lost one of your birds. Um, you know, I I care about my birds immensely. I would be, you know, sick with worry if they got out if they were loose. So try to keep that in mind. Most of the resources that you are going to have in the event that you lose your bird are also going to be great resources for if you find a bird. Um, so feed stores, vet offices, pet stores, um, you know, you can let people know that you have found that bird. Uh, and again, one of the good things to know, a lot of our birds have leg bands. Um, don't you know, you can ask the person if they say, oh, hey, I, I think that's my bird. Okay, great. The, it, the bird has a band. Do you know what the number is on that band? Because you may get people that are saying, oh, this might be my chance at a free bird. Because um, we know that birds aren't cheap. Um, so again, if you have that leg band information, if you have uh, microchip information available for your bird, you can identify your bird if it gets lost. Someone who loses their bird can use that information to, to help get their bird back as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's important I, that you write it down. So you've got it somewhere um, so that if, if you do lose it, you can tell someone, oh, no, no, my bird's band says X, Y, Z, whatever that may be. Um, and I think, too, if you go to, um, you know, uh, MSPCA or, you know, the ASPCA, you want to make sure that they have, if they're set up for bird care, um, that may not be, 
their forte, which is fine. And, you know, we can't expect just we're not all, you know, versed on every single animal. It's we all have our specialties. We all, you know, work with certain species. Maybe we can we can get by with with a variety of species, but you've got to um, you've got to be sure that they know what they're doing. You know, if you can't handle the bird or the person that finds it can't handle the bird, they've got to know that they're letting it go to someone who who knows what to do and how to care for that animal. Um, I, you know, I think some of us have had those experiences. Yeah, I have most certainly had those experiences. I've um, we've gotten birds that were rehomed through organizations and the organizations did cats and dogs. Um, so I go to pick up a bird that is in a cage um, in a room that is normally an office, but nobody's using it right now because there's a angry yelling monster <laughs> in there. Um, and, you know, everyone is lightly terrified of this animal because it's not something they're used to handling. Um, I, I think that's important to remember. Like, I take care of animals professionally. I've, we've shown you a lot of them here on this live stream. Uh, if somebody showed up at my door with like, oh, hey, I found this tiger. Can you take care of it? No, I, I, mm -hmm. I don't have the stuff to take care of a tiger. I don't have the knowledge. Um, for a lot of people, dealing with birds can be a similar situation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, Debbie mentions the record, how important having a full record of your birds and, you know, everything from the band number to the microchip number, um, which is another pr preparation that we didn't mention. Um, and we had talked about it beforehand um, was microchipping your bird. It's, you know, it's something that it's not a, a horrible procedure. It's an easy procedure. But, okay, so Zorro's band was removed, but he was chipped. So, you know, you've got – Melissa has at least something to to back up, back it up. Um, you know, when she says that Zorro's her bird, she can prove that because he's chipped. And having the chip put in is not – you know, it's not a horrible procedure. Simple, easy breezy, and it can, you know, quite honestly save your bird's life. Well, and that is actually an important point to bring up as well. So when you're doing regular photos of your birds, um, especially if you're doing something like an annual exam uh, through your vet, your vet can help you get those really good photos of your birds. Make sure you are taking a look at your birds' bands because uh, if they have plastic bands, they can fade over time. If they have metal bands, uh, if they're a colored metal, the color can fade over time. Uh, if they are etched with numbers or letters, that can become unreadable over time. So you just want to make sure that you know the status of those bands. And then, of course, bands can break. Um, you know, bands can get caught on things. They can rip off. So, um, you know, just make sure you're paying attention to that as well. Absolutely. So there's a lot of prep work that goes into this, and, and it's but it's well worth it. And so the thing we wanted, the other thing we wanted to talk about tonight was recall training. So I guess we want to start out by saying that doing recall training at home is not necessarily the same as what's going to happen outside. Yeah. Um, outside is new and different and scary. And, you know, at home, when we introduce things, we try to introduce like one new thing at a time and, you know, we want to try to keep stress to a minimum. Outside doesn't care. Um, it'll throw everything at your bird all at once. Um, another thing to remember, if your bird lives primarily inside your house, windows are going to filter out most UV light, birds see in the UV spectrum. So when they get outside, when they're seeing, you know, unfiltered sunlight, they are seeing the world in a brand new way that they may not be used to. That alone can be jarring. So uh, it's one of those things. These skills are important to build, but please know that in a stressful, outside, brand new situation, it's just not going to be the same thing. Right. I mean, and I think, you know, the important thing to remember is that if you're you're doing some some training you at least have a cue that's established, a reinforcement history for flying to you. Um, you know, the cue of, 
you know, come or whatever you decide you want to use as that cue for the recall, it's established. And so it's not going to be the end all be all. But if you go out and, and your bird's out there, it may just trigger that moment for the bird to come down to you. So you want to start with short A to B flights. We've got some really cool video. Um, I want to thank Melissa Davis. Melissa sent us some video um, of her doing some recall training with Zorro. And I love this. I love it. Well, first of all, this is just damn adorable. <laughs> and here's Zorro coming around the corner and down the banister. I just, it, I'm thinking we might have to change his name to Mary Poppins. I don't know. Um, but this is one of the cool things I really like about this um, that Melissa has worked on is that Zorro came around the corner. Zorro doesn't have a visual. He comes around the corner to her, um, which is, is a pretty amazing skill. And so again, I'm the corner. Melissa is way more generous than I would be. I don't know that I'd give him a half a cash if you're flying around the corner in the house. But um, if, if he were outside, heck yeah, he's getting that, that, whole piece of cashew. Um, and he just, you know, comes around and this is wonderful, wonderful training. And I want to thank you, Melissa, um, for sharing this with us. So uh, and another, you're doing really cool. Go ahead, yeah. I was going to say another thing that's really cool about this. So seeing the same bird in two different setups, you can see that this behavior is getting generalized. So at one point, Zorro's just flying directly to you. At another point, he flies to a point and then he's sliding down the banister. So you can do recall on yeah. flight. You can do recall uh, on a bird that is walking to you across mm -hmm. a perch. Um, all of these are going to be skills that you can build, and they're all incredibly useful. So seeing the variety of skills that are used here, really great job. I mean, you know, a lot of times we talk. So we've been talking a lot about a bird that, you know, gets up in a tree, a bird that gets away. Um, and you know, we've got some birds out there that might just go out the door, not necessarily fly out the door, but walk out the door. You know, maybe we've got a bird that is completely, you know, grounded for whatever reason. Um, and that bird might go out the door and you're still got to go look for them. And if you've got a, so I think people get confused when we talk about recall training, that it's, um, it's not necessarily just you know, making that flight. Sometimes it's coming back to you across the, the floor, coming back to you across the perch, whatever that recall may be. I mean, for, for someone with a disabled bird that, you know, probably is not going to be in a situation where it flies out the door to someone like, I know Chris Armstrong's on tonight. Um, for Chris, recall is a completely different animal. Um, Chris has free flighted birds. And for Chris, a recall is, is gotta be crystal. It's gotta be solid. And, you know, so that's, that's the, there are differences in recall. It doesn't make the training strategy any different. Okay. So you can add obstacles like Melissa has the, has Zorro come around the corner. You can add obstacles for your bird to maneuver around because let's be honest, um, out there in, you know, the great big wide world, it's not always a straight shot. Sometimes your bird's going to have to go around, you know, a telephone pole or whatever to get to you. Um, and so you can add those obstacles in and practice when your bird can and can't see you. You know, that's that's, I think, great training um, is if your bird will recall when they can't see you. I mean, don't you think? Yeah, um, I completely agree with that. Sorry, I just had a. Redbird, one of her favorite things to do, she liked to climb down because she didn't like to fly around corners. She liked to walk around corners. So if I was in a room and then I went to the other room, she would climb down off her cage and then she would just come looking for me. And that is a skill that you can utilize as part of your recall training. Capture that behavior. If your bird is naturally seeking you out, like Put a cue to it. Reinforce it. Your bird is already doing what you want it to do. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, th there's a variety of ways that you can use that. Absolutely. And, you know, 
if you see something happening, if you see that recall occurring, whether it be your bird flying to you from his play stand or, you know, flying to you from his cage, use that, use and make and put a cue to it, capture it, make it a behavior that you can, you know, really work on and get a solid handle on before you really need it um, in an emergency situation. High value reinforcers. So if you're doing recall training, you want to make sure that it's worthwhile for your bird. Um, and the high, higher the value on that that uh, reinforcer, the better off you're going to be. Uh, you know, I mean, a pellet is probably, I mean, it might, if your bird's been out for a day or two, um, a pellet might get them down. Um, but if, you're, if your bird just flies off and you've got visual and you want to try a recall right then and there, you want it to be a big, a big payoff. The other thing is don't break your trust with that bird by offering something amazing and giving them a half a walnut when they come down. Cause yeah, yeah if it ever happens. Again. Yeah. That, that's sort of the point of bribing that bird using bribery. If I'm showing you a walnut, that means when you come down, you're getting this whole walnut. Um, if you show the whole walnut and give just a piece, uh, I would be pretty mad in that situation. Um, I, Robin, I don't know how you would feel, but I, I would be mad about it. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, another thing I just want to point out there, this is something we've talked about before. When you're picking your reinforcers, remember your bird is the one that pretty much assigns the value of those reinforcers. You have to pay attention to what they see as the most valuable thing. So to give you guys an example, uh, Grayson, the umbrella cockatoo that we have shown doing numerous behaviors multiple times, you would think that the bigger the food item, the more excited he would be about it. Something like a walnut, he should love. He he doesn't. He doesn't like walnuts because he can't break in. He can break into them eventually, but it takes him a little more time. Meanwhile, small pieces of dried papaya, he goes absolutely crazy for. So you need to just know what is going to be the highest value reinforcer for your bird. Pay attention to that. Absolutely. And with the, so you've got your small approximations, you're working, you're building, you're building, you're building. Um, you've got to make sure you don't slack on the criteria. So if you set a criteria of, I want you to fly this distance, or you need to come, you know, recall from this distance, don't say, oh, that was close enough. Because if you say close enough, then you're building what's called latency. And latency is when your bird figures out that, oh, if I eventually go, she'll, she'll reinforce that. It's got to be, they've got to respond right away. It's not you cued him 72 times and he came and he got that, that big jackpot reinforcer. Because he has now learned that, oh, well... <laughs> I'll just hang out and eventually I'll, when I feel like it, I'll go back. And that's when I get my reinforcer. So you've got to make sure you don't want to build latency and then have that happen in an emergency. Right. And part of that is going to be understanding where you are in the training process of your bird, where you are in terms of your approximations, because uh, yeah. So if I have a brand new bird that has never done anything for me before and I ask it to come to me and it comes halfway, I may reinforce that because that's at least that that's a step in the right direction. If I have a bird that is regularly flying to me or it flew to me once or twice and I start letting it slack off, like the behavior gets worse and worse, that's something you want to avoid. So just pay attention to where you are in your training. Um, again, we have, I, I think we found a way to bring this up for just about every live stream. If you record your training sessions or have somebody else watch your training sessions, they're going to be able to help clue you in on, uh, you know, what is the bird's body language? When exactly is it reacting? Because sometimes it may seem like, oh, no, the bird did everything I wanted. And then you watch it on video and you realize, uh, actually, it initiated the behavior before you even offered a cue um, because it just was anticipating everything. It's released a behavior before you release the bird. Um, so, the, I mean, those are just things to keep in mind. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And Melissa did say um, that she no longer gives Zorro a whole nut. Um, so I was only teasing you, Melissa. I just, I, you know, 
whatever works, quite honestly. Um, you just get them to fly more often if you don't give them that big piece. So yeah, she said she doesn't do that anymore. So no worries. I love your training with Zorro. I think it's great. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure you add this to your regular training session. So you keep it current. This is the one behavior that you don't want to see go away. This is the one that you want to, to maintain and you want to keep it and keep your bird as current as possible on this behavior. So, right. Um, and the way that your bird does it may be highly individualized to your bird. Maybe your bird doesn't fly to your hand or to your arm. Maybe they fly to a perch. Maybe they fly to a station. Um, if you have like a tabletop stand or anything that your bird knows to fly to. Um, so just make sure that you are working on that in the way that is best for your bird. Because again, the reason Robin and I are putting these live streams together, we want to make sure you guys all have this information that you guys are set up for success. Um, again, we don't want this to happen to anybody, but we want you to be prepared in case your bird gets away, um, that you'll be able to get your bird back safe and sound. Absolutely. So this was the down and dirty on how to recover an escaped bird and on recall training. So we, you know, absolutely want you to delve more into this and really make a plan that's going to work for you at home. Um, you know, it, it may not be the same steps that we have. It may not be, you know, all the same resources, but create a plan for you, something that works because the chances are, are fairly good that this could happen. Um, so, all right. So we've got a trivia question, right, Jack? Yes, we do. Um, so again, remember that we always do a trivia question, uh, at the end of every live stream. So you guys can win something. And I don't remember what they're going to win. Uh, they are going to win a get your bird back DVD or a free download, whichever they prefer. They just need to let me know. So what's the most important thing to do if your bird flies off? Get that fabulous, and, and you get the picture of me too on the back. So that is more than worth answering this trivia question. <laughs> um, well, we can autograph it you take the DVD, just saying. <laughs> Oh, so we have a winner, Lori McFarlane. Very nice. Remain calm. It's, you know what I like to think of? So for those of you that have seen Animal House, um, the part at the end, the movie Animal House, the part at the end where Kevin Baker, Kevin Baker, Kevin Bacon says, remain calm. All is well. So you want to remain calm. Just really mean it. That's all. So um, you guys, I, you know, this is a, it's a tough subject to discuss and it's really tough to get people to think that it might happen, you know, but it's a possibility. And the fact that you work with your birds, you, you feed them, right. You enrich their lives. You do all those things. You've got to be prepared for this. You know, this is the biggie. This is the, the bird that might never come home, you know, and uh, Chris, Thank you, Chris. Um, it Chris takes a, a huge risk. Chris is a free flyer. Um, and Chris knows the value of being prepared. It's a lifestyle that, that Chris lives. And, you know, but I, I guarantee you that Chris, you know, has all these tricks up his sleeve and is ready to use them if one of his free flyers goes, you know, and has a fly off. So, all right. Um, Thank you so much again um, for, you know, tuning in. And it's so nice to see all of you. Jack and I really enjoy doing these. Um, it's, it's really, you know, it's a lot of work. Um, to, I know it looks like it's just kind of chit-chatting, but it, there is work behind this. Um, and we hope that you all enjoy it. Uh, and, you know, if the, again, if there are topics that you think, um, that we could handle that you'd like to see, please let us know. Um, if you want to see more of us, uh, register for the conference. It's June 11th through the 13th. I'm going to tell you the the lineup is pretty incredible. It's, uh, you know, Hilla Neiman from Germany, my Miguel Santos from Zumarine, Portugal, Dr. Susan Club, 
Danny Poirier Larson from Southwick Zoo, um, who you've seen a little bit here with us. Um, and Jack and I are doing, uh, we're each doing a session and we're also doing the hands-on workshops. Um, you're going to get a, a, a skewer kit to go um, with the one of the workshops. And it's really a it's a very interactive format is what we're hoping for. We want to be, you know, approachable for you guys. We want you to feel comfortable. We want you to feel like you can ask questions. Um, this is another thing. Thank you, Nick, for putting that up there. Um, I saw some of these masks the other night. I was doing a talk. Um, and these are some really amazing masks. They are handmade um, and by a gentleman in Long Island and his Facebook page is called Some Guys Sewing. The QR code there will take you um, to where you can get some of those masks. He has some really cool materials because he's a bird guy. Um, you know, like all the rest of us, he's loving those birds. So um, if you are interested in these, please check out Sean's site um, on Facebook, his page, and uh, support a fellow bird owner. Um, so anything else, Jack, that I didn't remember? <laughs> well, again, guys, just remember that we do these live streams every Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, again, if you like the Leather Elves page on Facebook, that'll make sure you get a notification. You won't miss out on any of these sessions. If you subscribe to the High Red Bird YouTube channel, you can watch them all in case you miss any of them. Uh, there is also a High Red Bird YouTube group. So again, if you guys have any suggestions, any requests on topics you would like to see, you can reach out to Robin on the Leather Elves Facebook page. You can reach out to me on the High Red Bird Facebook page. Uh, you can reach out to both of us because that's fun and you want to do that. Just let us know what sort of topics you guys would like to see. Um, we obviously have uh, quite a few topics that we are planning, um, you know, and Again, all of this is information that we think is important for bird owners to have easy access to. Um, so that's why we have been doing these sessions for, oh, oh God, like, I think we're at about half a year now. <laughs> I think we are. And, you know, it wasn't something that, that we planned was going to go on and go on and go on, but we really enjoy interacting with all of you and we keep thinking of different topics that we want to share, you know, our experience with you. So, um, and yet Debbie's absolutely right. Nick, you are amazing. And we always want to thank Nick as well. Um, Nick is, is he's what he's the person that makes us look good. So um, who needs a stylist when you've got Nick? Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's a lot of fun. So I just want to let you guys know next week's topic is making the connection, conservation and your feathered friend. So it, I, it's a, that's a fun topic. Um, and uh, hopefully we will see you all. I, we didn't hit 50 tonight. Um, so next week you can bring a friend. Let's not forget. We're, we're going to have a group called Flippy's Stalkers. Wow. You know, Diane, I'll take that under um, advisement, but uh, I don't know. It's it's kind of not rocket surgery that that's not going to be it. But anyway, all right. Have a wonderful week, you guys. We really enjoy spending our Friday evenings with you. Um, take care and uh, and have a great week. Bye-bye. <laughs>